We've been in a message that we've, or in a series we've been entitled uh, Family Roots. And what we've been talking about is, we've been talking about kind of what sets us up as, as a church, like who we are um, as a church. And so we've talked about each week, we've kind of introduced a different phrase. And so apart from the phrases, what's kind of feeding those phrases is a couple of truths that I think I've said every week, but this being our last week and our fifth week in it, I still want to want to go through those. And so for us as this local expression of Jesus's church, that first and foremost, it is Jesus's church, that Jesus promises and he says this to his disciples, that he will build his church and that the gates of hell will not prevail against Christ's church. And so we just want to be a church an expression of Jesus's larger picture and of the church that Jesus is building. And so how is Jesus building it? Well, he's building it upon his word. He's building it upon his work that he's done in the gospel. He's building it through the power and the work of the spirit among us. Jesus is building up his church. We looked at it a couple weeks ago in Ephesians. It says through the church, the manifold wisdom of God is being made known. And so everything we know about God and his draw to salvation or what we know about God is being, it's being manifested into his church so that we can, um, which brings us to the next point, which is we are a church that will be founded upon uh, these actions, the actions of going and being the church. And so we're not a church about just coming and hearing, coming and, 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 and like building, but we're about going and, and being that church that Christ is, is, uh, is building. And so, so we're going to be about going and beating, be, being. And then lastly, the third thing that we've looked at is that God's blessing and what I mean by God's blessing is God's, God's work, God's love, God's grace, God's word, right? None of those things terminate with us. But ever since the very beginning in, 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 one, of the first, in one of the very first covenants God ever cut with people that we're seeing the, the manifestation of that in the church, which is in, was with Abraham, that God says that I'm going to establish you as my people and I will bless you but it doesn't terminate with you that we are blessed in order to be a blessing. And so that goes with that going and being the church is that we are a church that we want to overflow in blessing to others. And so today what we have is the phrase of servant-minded. And so we've chosen this idea of servant-minded. Um, it, it's kind of the, the, ter- the term is, is we want to try to drill down and be as particular as we could with it, and yet knowing that we may be inadequate in it. And so uh, what we mean by, 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 by servant-minded is it's, this, it's the attitude, although I think it permeates even deeper than an attitude of who we are as, as Christians, that I think like oftentimes we talk about serving one another and the way that we visualize that is we would say, okay, if I can somehow work out some time, so kind of seeing like, like my day, my month, my week, my, my whatever as kind of a pie chart. And so I've got chunks of the pie taken up with, with stuff that I'm doing, which is like work, right? Big chunk of, for, for most of it, big chunk of our pie, of our pie graph of our time is done at work. There's a pie, okay, you know, there's some time in there that's going to be spent for some sleep, some time going to be spent in there hopefully eating something good, you know, some time going to be spent in there where I'm engaged if you're a Christian in community, right? There's some time in there that I'm going to play. There's some time in there spent with my kids. And then what we would see in that is, okay, I need to, I need to pie out a section of time in there that I'm going to dedicate to serving others. But in that kind of approach, we're missing the, the kind of the, the deepness of what it means to be a servant. That when we talk about being servant-minded, it's not just something that we do, but it's who we are. That serving others, for those of us who are Christ followers, that's not just something that we're doing with our time, but is, it is foundational in the very core identity of who we are to follow Christ. It means that we are servants. That serving isn't just something that we do, but it's like who we are as followers of Christ that he's called us to, to um to serving others. And so whether you're at work, whether you're at play, whether whatever you're doing, you're constantly approaching it with the mentality, with the understanding, with the, with the attitude, with the mindedness of I am a servant and how can I serve those around me? 
that this speaks to our very posture, our very nature as followers of Christ, as he's called us to be servants. So we can look at that before we get into the Galatians passage. That's where you are. So you're in Paul's little letter of Galatians. Before we get there, let me read to you what Paul says in Philippians. So you, you stay in Galatians, but let me read to you what Paul says on this very subject matter in Philippians, just to kind of, to kind of couch Galatians in Philippians and for us to just see like the, the deepness of this being a servant. Paul writes this in Philippians 2, starting in verse 3. He says, Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let that rest a minute. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interests of others. Now, these are commands, but I want you to notice that, in, especially in Paul's writings, his commands are always, uh, are, are always couched in declarations of identity of who we are. So it's ne- it never just calls us to action without also teaching us and declaring who we are and giving us the power and the motivation and the means to accomplish what he's commanded us to do. We see that in this text. So verses 3 and 4 commands. This is what we're doing. Verse 5 gives us the motivation and the foundation for us to do this. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. That's the mind of counting others more significant than ourselves, looking out not just to our own interests, but the other interests of everyone else. It's yours, that mindset, that attitude. Have this mind, that's attitude, that's posture, that's mindset. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. You have it through the filling of the Spirit that comes when you become a believer. Verse 6, he says, who though he, now he's pointing to Jesus. Okay, okay, like, This is to teach us, like, okay, servant-mindedness, like, this is what Jesus has done. Who, who, though he was in the form of God, did did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped or held onto, but he made himself nothing. So, so here what he's talking about is Christ's, uh, humiliation. That Christ was, was born a human, even though he is God, eternal, right? Part of the Trinity. And yet he's become nothing, humili- putting on flesh. It isn't that he left who he was, but he added to who he was a human nature. So he's not counted with equality with God, something to be grasped. It's who he is by nature, but he made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant. That's Jesus, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. So Christ has chosen this path of humility for us by his birth, by his life that he lived. Right? There, there was a time where Jesus was like, the Son of Man has no place to lay down his head at night. And Jesus didn't come and hire a bunch of servants to build a big mansion for Jesus to live in. But Jesus was at times homeless. Jesus kind of moved around. Jesus born into, not, not to a kingly family, but to a poor peasant family. That's Jesus growing up like that, living, living among us as humans like that. So he's, he's humi- his humi- humility is taking the form in his, his birth, his life, ultimately his death. That's what he says. He's, he's humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. In verse 9, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the, of the Father. So Jesus taking this path of humility and then timely exaltation. While he, he's here on this earth, humility, timely exaltation in his resurrection, his ascension where he sits at the right hand of the Father, and also in his, uh, it, it, in, in his office as, as judge as well, he's been exalted. And so that's a reminder for us when we get to Galatians of, of, of the deepness of us being servants, that Christ has filled us and Christ himself has, has, has exampled, first of all, what it means to be a servant. But second, he has filled through the work of the Spirit. He has filled us to be servants. All right, Galatians 5. 
I'll just read a couple of verses. We'll Starting um, verse 13. Again, Paul writes and he says this, <clears throat> for you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. So let's just break down this text. Like pretty simple, but we'll just unpack it. The first thing he says is, Paul says, for you were called to freedom, brothers. Now that's kind of a different picture of Christianity than maybe that you've been accustomed to, or maybe that you pictured prior to coming to Christ or possibly even your understanding of Christianity even now, that Christianity is a call to freedom. Like on the other side of being a Christian, didn't it feel like becoming a Christian would be something very restrictive? Like on the other side of becoming a Christian, maybe you even thought about it and thought like, wow, like Christians, they can't. And then you had this list of things that you couldn't do. Maybe it was, you know, you're part of a legalistic church. So that list was increasingly long and you thought, oh my goodness, who would ever want to become a Christian? Like look at all of the, what you thought were freedoms that you give up in order to become a Christian. And yet what Paul says here, you've been called. And not, you, you've been called into freedom. What Paul said in Galatians 5, 1, for freedom, Christ has set us free. And so the question then we would have is, what are we free from? Well, two things primarily that we see in the New Testament we've been freed from. One of them we've already sung about. The other one we haven't sung about, but we'll talk about. The first one is we are freed from sin that Christ has called us to freedom, and our freedom is a freedom from sin, from the dominion, from the slavery, from the taskmaster of sin. Now, for those of you in here who are a Christian, we're not, gonna sh we're not gonna raise our hands, but how many of you are living perfectly right now, sin-free? Like, like, let me tell you about my week, right? And I will show you that that's not wrong. You're like, how has he freed us from sin? He's freed us from the dominion of sin, from sin being a, a taskmaster. Yes, we still have indwelling sin in us, but ultimately our position is a position of freedom from sin, and hopefully your life looks increasingly more and more like holy, although yet it's still like we haven't, uh-oh, don't anybody freak out. Like, it's not a bird. See, if we would have left the bird in here, the bird would have ate the wasp, and we wouldn't have had this problem. Like, which would you rather have, birds or wasps? Did you all see the, I think it's a mud dauber. That's what we always tell our kids, isn't it? And they don't sting, right? So nobody scream like, like this would be the test, especially you men. If it comes near you, don't scream like a little girl. We have dominion over insects as well, right? Genesis. Uh, so if we're honest with one another, though, even though we are no longer under the, the taskmaster, the dominion of sin, we see that as well in Romans 6, 14, Paul writes, for sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but you're under grace, and which leads us to the next point. So if one is, what are we free from? We're free from the dominion of sin. We're no longer under the bondage of sin. We're no longer enslaved to sin. But that's the picture of, that's the picture that Jesus gives of sin is sin is slavery. But Christ has set us free. Isn't that good news for our hearts? Massage that deeply into your hearts that Christ has set you free from the dominion of sin. But second, Christ has set us free from the law. And that's what Paul's really getting at here in Galatians is he's teaching us that, that he's teaching the Christians in, in Galatia as well as to us that Christ has set us free from the law. And here's what we mean by the law. Let's define this. Is the law is the list of codes, rituals, and ceremonies of a legalistic form of Judaism. 
Okay, so what we have, let me give you context. So it's always helpful in understanding a scripture if you understand the context of when Paul wrote it and who he wrote it to and what was going on when it was written. So you have in this region a bunch of people that have converted to Christianity, all right? Most of them which were pagan before. They didn't, they weren't part of a formal religion, but now they've become Christians. And now you have a group of hyphenated Christians of Christian Jews, hyphenated together. They're they're a group called the Judaizers. They've moved into Galatia, and what they're teaching these new baby Christians is, is, hey, you need Jesus, plus you also need some of this external parts of, of the Jewish covenant, of the old covenant, some of these rituals and ceremonies. For example, men, you all need to be circumcised now if you want to be a Christian. The men are like, oh, is this true, you know? They're like, you need to follow these food laws now. There's certain foods that you can't eat, and there's certain foods that you need to stay away from, you need to abstain from. There's certain ceremonies that you need to work in. There's now a sacrificial system you need to come into. And so there's all this kind of confusion. And so Paul is writing this letter to these Christians to help clear up the confusion. What he's saying is, you've been freed from that form, that part of the law. That part of the law is no longer binding upon you as a Christian. What part of the law is binding upon us as Christians? Well, the moral law, the ethical law, that as we look at the law proper in the Old Testament, what we see is the law can be broken down to into three chunks. And so right now on, as my dad calls it, face pages, right? You follow me? Right now on face pages, there's a clip from the West Wing that's being used in a very abusive way of saying like, well, then if you're going to use this part of the law, you got to take all of the law. And it's like how to shut down a Christian in like, like five seconds. This, what I'm teaching you now is the answer, the biblical answer to what's going on in that clip. And if you haven't seen it, then thankfully, like you're, you're better off having not seen it. Like, right. Cause it's just like, like there's a lot of places to get theology. But just, just if you get your biblical theology from a TV script, like really? Like do you realize we live in a culture where, the t- where people for- are forming their biblical theology not from the Bible, not from scholars who know the Bible, who study the Bible, not from pastors who give their life to understanding and studying the Bible, but from movie actors Like, that's the culture that we live in. And so there's better places to formalize your theology than the West Wing or fill in the blank, right? And so the answer to that is the law is to be understood is it's broken down into three chunks, three sections. You have the the moral, ethical law that is binding upon all of creation, all people for all times, It doesn't change from people group to people group. It doesn't change from the old covenant to the new covenant. We're going to look at a section of that ethical law starting next week when we get into the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. Like nowhere does God say like, you know what? I'm good with adultery now. Jesus has fulfilled the law. Don't worry about adultery. Live it up. Live it up. Right? He never says that. He never says stealing's okay now. Go ahead. You need something? Help yourself. Go down to Lowe's. I need a new chainsaw. It's a good idea. Go to Lowe's, jerk one off a shelf. No, that's never, that's never okay, right? There's this moral, ethical law that's always binding. Second, there is in the law, there is the, ju- the judicial law. And so what you have in Israel is Israel is a theocracy. So you have their religion and their government together in one. So the religious leaders are also their governmental leaders, their judicial leaders. And so you have that. And so you have within within the the law, you have the law that would be kind of governmental laws. Don't speed, right? Uh, Pedestrians have the right of way, like those kinds of things, even though that's not really what's in there. But also what you have in there, though, is you have harsh punishment. Maybe we'll get to that. Thirdly is in the law, you have the ceremonial law. And this is a list of the rituals and ceremonies and the restrictions that have been put upon Israel. It's important. They've been put upon Israel. Why? Was to keep them a separate people because from them is the promise of Jesus. 
And if they just integrated, oh, well, where's the Jewish people? They've been lost. We don't know where they are. Then how would we know for certain Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ coming from them? That in order to keep a pure conduit, God gave them all of these restrictions to keep them pure so that from one of them will, become, will come Jesus. Added to the law then was the priest's interpretations and restrictions. So they had like a thousand years of priests interpreting and adding to crazy stuff. Like, okay, keep the Sabbath day. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Don't do any work on the Sabbath. Okay, then what's work? Well, let me give you 68 ways of things that are work and 72 things that aren't work. So they would have stuff like you could pick a chair up and carry it in your home, but you couldn't drag a chair. Because if you dragged the chair in the dirt floor, then you were cutting like furrows into the ground, which be considered plowing. And so don't do that. So you need to carry it. So you get, like, you get the idea. So all of this being the law and what Paul's teaching here is that Christ has come to fulfill the ceremonial law, the judicial law, and certainly he's come to fulfill all of that craziness that's been added to the law. So what does he mean by our freedom from the law? Like here's where this becomes good news for us. Is the law was given to demonstrate what true holiness is and to show us that we can't make it on our own. That as we, as we look and as we read and as we study, even as we read and look and study, even the Ten Commandments starting next week, like we're, the first one out of the box will crush you. Right? Worship, love God, worship God and him alone. It speaks to our affections. It speaks to how we order our lives. It's like what I always say. I always like pause and go like, how you doing on that one, right? Crushing. That one of the purposes of the law was to crush us, to make us feel spiritually frustrated and spiritually inadequate, that no one approaches the law and go like, I got that. I'm good with all those. Like there was a group that did that called the Pharisees. You know, the same ones that put Jesus to death, the same ones that Jesus called out, the same ones he called them like sons of the devil, told them like you go and you make someone and you convert them over to your way of thinking and you make them worse of a son of hell than they ever were. Like that group of people that were so, that, that thought they had it nailed outwardly but were missing it inwardly. Like no one looks at the law and says, man, I got that, that the purpose of the law is to crush us, is to make us be, feel spiritually frustrated. Second, the law also, it frees us and it helps us to see that the rituals and the ceremonies, that they point us to the fact that God is holy, that we are sinners, and that a sacrifice is necessary for sin, and that Christ has become that sacrifice, and that he has freed us from the frustration that says, I can't make it, I can't do it. And through Christ, we have the Holy Spirit. So it's no longer something that is external, binding on us in the law, but it's now going internal in us that has forever changed us, that that frees us. I mean, the issue is still obedience to God. See, that's the problem. They're like, well, well how, what's going to make you be obedient to God? And how do we know what obedience to God looks like? And all of those sorts of things. But what Paul's teaching here is the Spirit in us Re, re, uh, recreates our hearts, rejuvenates our hearts. It speaks to us inwardly and, and changes us and gives us a new desire that outwardly the law was very fear-based. I mean, think about it. it uh, for, for the adulterer, you know what the penalty was for adultery under the law? You get stoned. You know, the, you know what the penalty for for being a false prophet was under the, under the law? Same. You got stoned. Like, that means Benny Hinn would have been stoned years ago, right? Like, like, there would be no TBN right now, which could be a benefit of being under the law, but nevertheless, we're not. We're not under the law, right? We're under, we're under, we're under grace. And so it was very fear-based. There was these strict punishments in place to keep us, but no longer is it just fear, but it's now been changed to love. Then now because of who Jesus is and as we see ourselves as sinners and as we know that like we needed a sacrifice in the place to take place for our sin, that the law has crushed us. And so it's not our performance 
that appeases God because we can never perform well enough because, again, we'll just take the first commandment. Nobody has kept the first commandment. So what will we do? Are we all destined to hell? No, here's the good news. Christ has come and kept the first commandment, all of the commandments, kept them perfectly. Every single bit of the law has been kept perfectly. And through your faith in Christ, you're joined with that. And Christ's perfection, Christ's perfect law keeping is accredited and accounted to you. Christ's sacrifice of his death covers every place where you failed in that law. It covers it. So when Christ, so when the father sees you, when Christ will judge you, he won't judge you as one who has, who has failed in keeping the law but he will judge you as one who has perfectly kept the law, even though you haven't, but he did for you. And why? Why? Because of his great love for you. Because in you, he chose you so that he may lavish his grace and his love upon you. And when you take that into your heart, when you genuinely get that, when that illuminates you, it forever changes you. And so you no longer need this external commandment telling you to obey God, but you obey Jesus. Why? Because you love Jesus. That Jesus' love for you and his love being displayed in this sacrificial way for you, that his love awakens your love for him. And that changes you. So what keeps you, what helps you to obey, what empowers you to obey God in all of the moral and ethical ways, it's, God, it's Christ's love for you and your love for him. That's what Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey me. So obedience doesn't go out the window. God's ethical law doesn't go out the window. We don't just go, okay, I'm free now. See, that's what Paul's saying. I'm free now. I can live however I want to live. No, what he's saying is when you take in Christ's love, that love changes you, it forever changes you, where your utmost desire is obedience. So you're not not obeying because of the death penalty. You're obeying because you want to obey. You're obeying because when you read Scripture and it it reveals in Scripture an incongruence in the way that you live life, you desire for there to be congruence. You're like, Lord, teach me. Show me. Let me delight in your laws and your commands because there's still commands in Scripture. It's not like, oh, all the commands get thrown out. This is a command. Love your neighbor as yourself is a command. And now when you read it, you go, Jesus, that's what you did. You loved me. See see what I mean? Right? It changes us fundamentally. It changes us when we see Christ. We go, I want to do that. I want to be that. Change me to be like you, Jesus. And so that's the the law. (laughs) What the heck? There's no way now. Like, I'm on page two of my notes of seven pages. All right. (laughs) That's just the first part. Oh, my gosh. What have you done, son? All right. You were called to freedom, brothers. Like, get that? Can we move to point two? I got 11 points. We're on point two. No, I'm joking. Can we, you you follow what I'm saying there? So it's not fear-based, it's love-based. It's not external, it's internal but still the result is the same in obedience. It's it's to live obediently. So brothers, you've been called. Look, he says, you've been called to freedom, brothers. Although, look, there's two ways that you can respond to that freedom. Response number one is what Paul says here. Response number one is, but do not only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love, serve one another. So two Two different responses or reactions to your freedom that's in Christ Jesus. Number one is you can spend that on yourself, which he says is in the flesh. Or second, you can use that to serve one another. How are you going to use your freedom? Are you just going to spend it on your your flesh? So what does he mean there by the flesh? Well, he just means you. Is your freedom all about you? Is you knowing Christ all about you? Is your freedom from sin and the love that's been poured out, is it all about you or does it serve some other function? 
The other truth that we can look and we can highlight here about the flesh is the flesh is always empty. The flesh always denotes something that is empty, needing to be full. That the flesh, think about it when you were living in the flesh. So he contrasts oftentimes flesh versus spirit. We see that in Romans 8th chapter, that we once were in the flesh under the dominion of sin, but now we've been set free, adopted into family. We're now in and filled with the spirit. So in the flesh is our old way of life. In the flesh, you lived void of the knowledge of the love of God. Right? There was a vacuum in your life, void of the peace of God. In the flesh, you, were, you lived void of, of, of contentment in God, void of satisfaction, void of right? All of these spiritual things. And so what you did, because there was this vacuum in your life, is you tried to fill them with all sorts of other things, achievement and accomplishment and performance, right? Some men, we, 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 we find that in our job. We feel this void in our hearts, in our lives. And so we try to tamp down and fill that with accolades and achievements and education. Not that those things necessarily are bad, but it's when we're trying to fill something that's empty, something that's thirsty, something that's hungry within. Others of us, it's relationships. So we get to a relationship, we try to leverage everything we can get out of that relationship because ultimately that relationship doesn't exist about the other person. That relationship exists about me, my flesh. What can I have? What can I get? What can you give me? And what Paul's saying is when you've been set free in Christ, you no longer approach life as to what can you get out of it, but it's what can you give to it. Two ways to live. One is you see your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. I've been set free and this is all about me. It's all about what I can get. The second way to approach it, he says here, is it's in service to one another. That through love we serve one another. So this is marked from the opposite of not of a life that's empty, but a life that is full. That in Christ our emptiness has been filled that Christ is our portion, he is our satisfaction, and we are a people who are filled. In fact, in John 7, Jesus says this, he says, John 7, 37, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and he cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, that out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. And so he's speaking about a future event that we now have, that we're partakers of, which is the Holy Spirit. And so what he's saying before, you were thirsty, you were empty, but now in me, in Christ, through the work of the Spirit, you're full, you're like a bubbling spring, overflowing And how is it overflowing? What's overflowing in service to one another? That's what, that's this whole point here is the law. In fact, he's saying this, that the law, going back to the law, is being fulfilled in this. Love your, love, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's how it's being fulfilled. That it's, it's coming from love and service, not, not living to get See, the very opposite of that, but living to, to, living to give. That in fact, being servant-minded is rooted in loving your neighbor as yourself. Now, there's confusion as to what does the Bible mean when it says for us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. That in fact, some people believe that this is prescribing some sort of self-love that I gotta like me, and I gotta be okay with me, and I gotta no longer be frustrated by me in order for me to move on into being able to love other people, but yet I got tons of problems with me, so I can't love, I can't serve until I get me all straightened out, right? But that's not what the Bible's speaking of here. The Bible's not giving us a prescription for self-love. What the Bible is saying is it's, it's using the assumption. It's assuming a confident, it's confidently assuming that you already love yourself. You, like, no, that's not me, man. You got some other guy. Like, believe me, there's nobody in this room any more frustrated by 
themselves as I'm frustrated by me. Nobody. Well, I can't say that because I don't know you, but believe me. But, but here's what I mean by that. Like, we got to define love. And this is where Scripture helps to interpret Scripture. Remember we looked at in Philippians 2? Remember what Paul said? How, what's our attitude to be towards others? We're to be as concerned, be as concerned with others. Be, or he said, be concerned with others. Have your interests, not just on yourselves, but on, not just on yourselves, but on others as well. It's Philippians 2, 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. That's concern. Let each of you look out not to his own interests, but to the interests of others. That here's what this text, when it's, the Bible calls us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, that means be as interested, be as concerned, be as caring about others as you are yourself. See, that, that, that changes things. Because believe me, there's nobody as interested and concerned and caring about Andy Lawrence any more than Andy Lawrence is. Right? Like, I may not love myself, but you can bet, bet your <laughs> Bet your bottom dollar, right? So I think of what my mom used to say. I don't even know what that means. I guess your last penny. Don't do that. Don't bet because the law says don't bet. And don't take an oath either. But, oh, we're freed from the law. Okay, we're fine. Now. Even though I may not love me, even though I may be frustrated by me, I'm extremely interested in me. This, this week proved it. Uh, I think Tim Meskinpush gave us all a cold because he sat on the front row and coughed that he got out of the oh, swimming on the Ohio River, right? I mean, what do you expect when you swim in the Ohio River, right? But, so he got something and he's coughed. David's had it. I, Luann got it. Luann, Luann, got, Luann gave it to me. Thank you very much. I've given it now, I think, to Grayson. Others of you may have it. So this week, just like, just like everybody's coughing now. You're like, oh, yeah. You're all going to have it. It's, you know, just a head cold. So Luann got it first, so she was about two days into it. But there was no way she could ever convince me that she felt worse than I did. And I'd be like, like you're two days ahead of me. You're already feeling better. Like, you need to have more pity on me, <laughs> right? Like, you, no, no, no. You get up out of the bed and go get the box of tissues, you know? Like, oh, no, I, I'm sick too. Like, you're not as sick as me. Like, you know, and even though I sometimes didn't vocalize it, although I am a huge baby when I'm sick, even though at times I didn't vocalize it, I felt it, I believed it. And what was that revealing? Again, all that was revealing is my own interest in me. That's what, it's re that's what it was revealing. John Piper on this, I said, when John Piper wrote about love your neighbor as yourself, he said, it's not a command to love yourself. It's a command to take your natural already existing love of self and make it the measuring rod of your love for others. It means this. It means that we want to feed the hungry as much as we want to be fed when we ourselves are hungry. It means that we want to help our neighbor find a job when we ourselves are unemployed. It means that we want to help our neighbor move when we ourselves want help when we move. It means we want to show grace, compassion, forgiveness for our neighbor, for others, as much as we want grace, compassion, and forgiveness shown to us. It means that we want to show love and community to others as much as we want to be included and experience a community. It means that we care about others as much as we care about ourselves. It means that we're as interested in others as we're interested in ourselves. It means that we use all of the creativity and all of the energy and all the perseverance to do good things for others that we're doing good for ourselves. Think about, think about what this church would look like. Like if we lived that. Just think about that not just like what it would look like in here, right? But what that would look like on Tuesday evenings out there and Friday afternoons out there. 
Saturday mornings out there. You just think about what a radical difference like that really can make an impact in a culture, in a society, in a city. And in fact, that's how Paul ends this text with two pictures. Picture number one is a church filled with overflowing with love and service to one another. And second is a group of people, and he he offers this warning. Then he says, verse 15, but if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. So the first picture that he gave to us is a church that's filled with love, that Christ's love has so radically transformed that church that it's, it's filled by the power of the Spirit to overflowing for love and service to one another. That we're equally interested, we're equally concerned with ourselves as we are others, which is important as well because there's, there's times that you can give and there's times you need to receive. Like some of you hear that there's seasons when you need to receive, but your pride inhibits you from receiving. There's seasons when you're just empty and you're dry. You don't need to just, oh, like, how am I going to muster this up? No, there's seasons when you need to just rest. There's seasons when you need to serve, and there's seasons when you need to be served. Right? And you can't let pride inhibit the church from blessing you, and you're receiving the blessing of the church in that. So there's a picture of a church like that. But second, there's a picture here of a group of people that's marked by biting and devouring one another and ultimately consumed by one another. This is the empty church that turns inward, that turns to cannibalism. I was was thinking about that movie that came out in the 90s, I believe, sometime, but it was about the... I think it was a soccer team that was in a, I should have looked it up, but it was a soccer team that had a plane crash and they're stuck in the Andes Mountains. You know, they're freezing cold and they're up there and they get so hungry, there's no food that they, they turn to biting and devouring one another. But look, what's, what's at the source of that was intense hunger. A church that's starved. People that is starved, this is what Paul warns here, that they will turn and they will begin to nibble at one another. And because of their intense hunger, it'll be like, hmm, that tastes good. Right? What I mean by nibble at one another is they'll gossip. Instead of serving one another, they'll gossip about one another. Right? Instead of loving one another, they'll turn to bitterness toward one another. Instead of how can I exalt you, how can I help you, they leverage relationships to what, like I said earlier, to what they can get out of those relationships. Like I've I've been a part of that church, unfortunately. Some of you here, that's part of your story, is you've been a part of that church. And if you think back, it was a church that was it was deeply hungry hungry for Jesus' love, hungry for Jesus' truth. It was a church that had left those things and moved on past something else. By God's grace, we are a church that's marked by love and service to one another. I said this last week. I was like, man, I feel like the, the dude from the, from, from the movies is like, some amps have 10. We got 11 on our amp. Like, that's the way I feel like, I think a spinal tap. Like, you know, for here in this church, like, like some churches have like level of servitude 10, we've got 11, you know, like we're going all out, like just our serving quotient right now, in my opinion, is, is just fantastic. But that's not something we boast in. That's not something we take for granted. That's something we guard. That's something we protect. That's something we hold on to because Believe me, we have an enemy, an adversary that would love nothing more than to stir up disunity, mistrust, right? But to grief in this church. And so it's not something we just, it's kind of like in your marriage where you're like, man, by God's grace, our marriage is in a great season right now. 
You know, it's okay to, to, to go like, thank you, Lord, and give thanks for that. It's okay to verbalize that and to speak that and to go like, well, why is that? But it's not something you take for granted. It's something you guard and protect and you keep working at just to make that deeper and better. And so for us, we're not a church right now, I don't believe, that's marked by biting and devouring one another. But be on guard and know that it comes from being hungry. And so may we be a church that is so filled with the Spirit, so filled with Christ's love, so filled with Christ's grace that it keeps us full, that it protects us from biting and devouring and leads us, as Paul says here, to fulfill the law in loving one another as, and loving our neighbors as we love ourselves. And in fact, as we approach the Lord's Supper, may we come to the Lord's Supper this morning I was thinking about a song my gr- my grandfather he was he was an excellent pastor all jokes aside I mean just a fantastic pastor one of the things that he could do that I can't do <clears throat> is he could both preach and sing I could just preach I'm terrible at singing like I don't care I sing loud I, st- I stand right here sometimes like my daughter told me she was like like, we heard somebody singing, it was like, oh my gosh, who's singing? And I looked at it, it was you, Dad. And I was like, <laughs> which my response to that always is like the famous Jesus juke is, I wasn't singing to you anyway, Kennedy, you know? I'm singing to Jesus. And, um, and, but my grandfather, he could just absolutely flat out sing. And one of the songs he used to sing was a song in the chorus went like this. It said, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You remember his sweetest name I know. He fills my every longing and keeps me singing as I go. And this morning, some of you may need just to be honest as you come and as you approach the Lord's Supper that you're empty, that you're not full. Maybe you know Jesus or you don't know Jesus. Maybe you've yet to cross the line and become a believer and a follower of Christ. And maybe by the power of Spirit, the Spirit's revealing to your heart how empty you are. Like, it's your emptiness, it's your hunger that's led you here. It's your, I'm like, I need something, I want something. There's something out there, I don't know what it is, I can't quite lay my finger on it, but it's something, maybe I'll just go to church. And that's the leadership of the Spirit in your life. That's Jesus, by His grace, drawing you to Himself. And I pray that the Spirit would just clarify that in your heart and in your mind, you would see that. So maybe you see that and you understand that you're needy. Maybe those of you in here, you're Christians, but maybe you've just... Like the church in Revelation, you've lost your first love, you've left that, and you just find yourself hungry. Maybe life is just sucking you dry. You haven't spent time in the Word, you haven't spent time in prayer, you haven't spent time in community, you haven't spent time with godly people, and you just this morning, you feel like a parched desert. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. He's the sweetest name I know. He'll fill your every longing. Come and eat of him. Come and drink of him and let him fill you. Let him be your portion. Let him show you his love. That when Christ is serving us, when Christ is loving us, when Christ is showing his grace, when it's being lavished upon us and we realize that, that that fills us and that's being so evident here in the Lord's Supper, that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, Jesus took bread and he broke it. He took a cup and he, a, a, a goblet full of wine. We use juice here. And Jesus pointed to this and said, this is my body that was broken for you. This is my blood that will be shed and be poured out for you. Eat and drink. Do this in remembrance of me. And may we be a church this morning that remembers, remembers his love, remembers his grace. And as we remember that, may that fill us. May that fill our every longing. May that fill us to overflowing so that our service flows outwardly to others.